Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I am Banint Kleri. Uh, I am from Hungary. And uh, this is the title of my Google Summer of Code project. Uh, we have been working on this project uh, with my mentor, Károly Négyesi, well known as CHX in the community. Uh, this is my first real contribution to Drupal, uh, and I am very glad to be here. So, the current permission system we have has got some problems. The first is transparency. Uh, sometimes, uh, for Drupal newcomers, uh, it's hard to understand our permission system. And uh, sometimes we don't know the, the exact meanings of, of permissions. Of course, uh, we have labels and descriptions, and now we have warnings as well. But are these enough in every case? Uh, so, what we can do is try out a permission, if we, if we are not sure about that, uh, or, or read the documentation. It, if it exits, it's okay, <laughs> but uh, sometimes we have to read the code itself, uh, which is not so convenient. And if we don't know the exact meaning of a permission, it can lead us to ambiguous outcomes. And uh, one more big issue is, is the overlapping. Uh, some permissions uh, overlap, overlap with others. For example, administer content or administer users. And uh, nothing indicates this overlapping on the UI. And uh, these administer everything type permissions are the main sources of the overlapping problems. Uh, Many tasks uh, need these powerful permissions, but they are too powerful, and we don't want to grant these permissions for our users. Uh, so what, what can we do again? We have to use country modules for, for these tasks. And uh, let's imagine when, when we enable uh, some kind of node access module. Uh, it will change the whole game, and the permissions will lose their meanings. Uh, and there are security implications, uh, and I would like to mention these two permissions. The administer permissions is, if we have this permission, we can control the whole website. And uh, if we have the administer users, uh, the situation is, is the same, because we can edit the, the first administer, administrator user as well. So, again, full control. Uh, and the user interface is basically a sea of checkboxes. Uh, if we are working on a, on a small website, it's, it's okay, it's, it's not so hard. There are a few checkboxes, uh, we can use this easily. but when we are working on a larger website, this, this can be scary and needs serious concentration to use. Uh, and let me show you the permission screen of the examiner.com. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> and this is it in big. Of course, I, I have changed the modules names and the permission names, but this is the, the screen of the examiner.com permission page. What do you think? How many checkboxes? 700. 700? 1200. 1200? That's actually closer. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly 5,000 checkboxes, and that's hardly a friendly UI. I mean, I don't want to use this permission screen because it's, it's very scary. And our proposed solution is implementing a hierarchical permission system. What does it mean? 
we have a new concept, permission trees. You know, currently, the modules determine simple list when, when they define their permissions. Uh, but in a hierarchical way, the modules can define their permission sets as a hierarchically structured list. And that's what we call permission tree. Uh, now, a single permission is a path from a permission tree. I'm going to show you a permission tree. Uh, and if we have a system like this, the overlapping is not an issue anymore. And we have to deal with only the necessary permissions if we have a good UI. And we will have a good one. So let me show you a permission tree. This is the permission tree of the user module. Uh, I'm going to walk through on the main branches. Uh, the first is the user profiles. Uh, People.user profiles. I'm going to use the dot delimiter. Uh, and the main idea he, uh, is here to make possible to control the access of, of fields and the other properties uh, of the users. For example, the username, the signature, and the other custom fields. And we organized it by roles. Plus, we have the own profile, uh, which is similar to what node module do with own content. So, so it means our own profile, and the other roles uh, role X and role Y and so on, means other users' profiles. And um, as you can see, uh, we, we put the, the view permissions under the, the edit permissions. Uh, it can be weird at the first sight, but, but it's, it's, it's logical, because if we can edit a property, we can view it as well. Uh, one, uh, something here that is, wasn't clear about, I think, that uh, you can grant uh, any permission in the tree. So uh, you can say that I want to grant people.userprofiles.rollX to somebody. And that will mean that, uh, that you have granted uh, every, that permission and everything under it. Uh, that's how this hierarchy works. Yes, and, uh, and let me show another example. Uh, people that use a profile that role X that edit property X. So, so this, uh, that means I can edit that property in users uh, which are in that role. And I can view it as well because, because it's under the edit property. Okay, uh, the add users, I think, uh, no need to explain. Uh, it is the same, what we have now. And the, the grant rules uh, can be tricky. Uh, it means uh, assign roles for other users in other roles. And we, we organized it uh, by roles, similar, similar uh, at the above example. And uh, we can control which roles can be assigned to users. Okay. The next one is uh, cancel profiles. Uh, the organization is, is, is similar than, than user profiles. You can see the roles and, and the own profile and you can se select uh, methods for, for the cancelling. Uh, we have two new permissions, access user list and configure account settings. Uh, these two are very similar. Uh, we can narrow them. Uh, so we can narrow the access by rows and the access user list and uh, we can narrow the access by, by setting fields here at the configure account settings. Uh, for example, uh, if we have an editor role and uh, we want to allow them to edit the, the welcome uh, email messages, 
we can just grant them this permission. So people that configure account settings, that setting why, which can mean uh, edit welcome email messages. And the last one is administer permissions. Uh, it's it's uh, still a powerful permission, but we can choose uh, which permissions can be controlled. And uh, we introduce the one more level uh, only if a user have it. Because at time when we, when we grant this permission, for example, people that administer permissions that permission X, X sorry, uh, we, we don't know uh, what permissions have uh, that user. So we, we can say only if, if the user have it uh, and it, it solved this problem. And other problems <laughs> are solved. Uh, so the overlapping is noticeable, it's obvious, and it's understandable for everyone. And the options are well covered, so I think uh, the transparency issue is done. And uh, we can introduce a lot of new options, so the fine-tuning problem is solved. And we kill the problematic permissions, so we don't have security implications anymore. And the real challenge is the user interface. So, uh, because we have a hierarchical structure, using a tree visualization offers itself. Yes, there are a bunch of uh, JavaScript tree visualizations out there, so why don't we use just one of them? Because it's not a good idea. Trees with collapsing options are hard to explore and hard to review, so that's not a friendly UI. We have interactions which have to be easy. Explore the obtainable permissions. Grant permissions to roles. Review assigned roles and permissions. And revoke permissions from roles. These are our main interactions. We worked out a new concept called permission rules. Permission rule uh, is a single permission plus the assigned roles. Uh, so we have many permissions, but why don't we show only that ones which are in use uh, in the website? That, that's, the, that's the main idea. Uh, so let me show you a, a wireframe. Uh, at, at the last two weeks, uh, we have been working be, with uh, Boyan Zomers and uh, this wireframe uh, created by him, based on our permission rule concept and our earlier prototype demo. Uh, and I'm gonna show you this separated. So uh, what you can see here is, is the permission tree of user mod module, uh, which I showed you before. You can explore the, the main branches, the first level children's, uh, access user list, add users, cancel profiles, and user profiles. And uh, we added uh, labels for the deep, deeper levels, like all, edit, and view. And you can select permissions from each level and assign roles, and you can create permission rules. You can create many permission rules on the fly. And when you create it some, sorry, we have a list about these permission rules. Uh, we have default ones, uh, which can be provided by install profiles or ad other modules or, or anything else. Uh, and and it, it can be assigned to the administrator role. 
and the other ones can be deleted, as you can see the, the icons, and uh, we can change the assigned rows for a certain permission rule. So, this is the concept of, of permission rules, and uh, I, have, I have no more slides. Right. <laughs> so, questions? You need to put the mic on, because it's oh. recording whoever's speaking needs to have the mic. Yeah. Uh, so. Or stand close enough. <laughs> okay, yeah, the, we're going to share this uh, single one. So, questions? Peter? Uh, so do you have a scheme to make permission matching efficient? Uh, absolutely. Uh, that was basically the first uh, thing that Balin did. I think we went over about maybe eight different uh, implementations, uh, and we definitely have one that's uh, pretty speedy, because that was the first thing to verify before going in, you know, and creating the user tree, creating a user interface. We needed to see whether uh, such a, a time-critical uh, function uh, can be implemented reasonably fast. Uh, it is going to be slower, of course, because it's much more complicated. But uh, there are a few compromises made. For example, you cannot have wildcards uh, in the path because that, is, that wouldn't be, uh, that's just impossible to uh, match uh, fast enough. So what it does basically is that when you run user access ax.y.z, it begins to slice those off and checks whether you have those uh, basically uh, in a preloaded array. So the only thing it's slower than the current one is because it needs to do the string uh, slicing and it needs to run a few iterations, but it's not horrible. It, it's, uh, as I say, it's of course slower than the current user access function because the current user access function, once you have run it over uh, a user, it is basically one is set function. So this necessarily needs to be uh, slower, but within that frame, we have found what we think is the fastest possible solution, and I think it's going to be uh, fast enough. Uh, Ryan and the, the, the reality here is that, yes, user access by default is very fast. But the moment you have problems with user access, right now the only thing you can do is to resort hacks. And those are going to be slower. So instead, we have a better solution at a little performance uh, price. Salvis? Is there some locking or, or auditing? Like, uh, can you, uh, a week after something has been changed, look up who changed what? Uh, we haven't yet sort of uh, adding an audit log to this. That's a very good question, I must admit. But uh, I don't think that would be too hard. I mean, I would imagine that if you have a site which needs an audit log, that probably needs to uh, be much more than just the user uh, in the, uh, just uh, than the user uh, edit a actions you know uh, if you have such a site then you probably need a full uh, act audit log about many things uh, which of course immediately begins to uh, trail into the things where we want more of drupal to be api driven so that you can hook uh, into these things and make such an audit possible. More questions? Yes? I'm not sure how do you get a number of your global overview of what's going on when you're not actively examining one rule of your own Sorry, uh, I didn't hear the question. Let me uh, come up to you. Sorry. Uh, we thought it was near a wireframe slide. 
you repeat the question? Yeah, I will. So basically the question is that how does this wireframe uh, solve the um, uh, problem of the discovering permissions? That was your question, right? Right. Uh, as you can see, uh, it shows the top level permissions and under the top level permissions, you can see immediately every single one. So uh, a, instead of having a tree where you need to open every level to see below it, uh, in here, you only need to open up the top level, which for user module, there are like four. So it, it, this uh, wireframe, this uh, idea uh, gives you a pretty good uh, visibility uh, without uh, drawing the screen uh, with 5,000 checkboxes. There needs, it's, it's an untrivial exercise, right? Uh, if you want to show everything, it's not gonna work. Uh, because uh, with this system, there are certainly going to be, uh, even for medium sites, probably uh, a couple thousand uh, different permissions possible. Uh, so you cannot really show every single one of them at the same time, uh, and yet you want to show as many as possible, uh, which is uh, how we came up with this uh, type of thing, where you see where you click on the top level and then you see each level side by side and you can uh, pick uh, by checkboxes on them. That's pretty much uh, about that. I guess a, a live demo would uh, work better, but we only have a live demo for uh, previous iterations, so I can't really show this uh, right now. I only have wireframes. We, we we still have time for a uh, uh, we still have a few more minutes not much but any more questions so describe some of the hacks that this uh, allows you to work around so hacks that you've seen like yeah so for example right now uh, if you need a field level uh, if you need to uh, grant edit access uh, to a field. You need to install a contrib uh, which uh, will give you the possibility uh, to generate a permission uh, to uh, actually to be able to grant uh, edit access to it. Now the discoverability of this is plain horrible. It's, it's absolutely untrivial that you install the field permission module you need to go to the uh, field UI screen for that field, generate the permission, and then you can add it. Uh, it's not gonna exist for uh, every uh, field because current, because with the current UI, that would be DAS. If you would, you know, if you, if you would have all the possible permissions uh, for uh, every field uh, that you have. So that's uh, one thing uh, that uh, the system uh, solves because uh, of this uh, hierarchy thing. Uh, instead, uh, and this wireframe solves it, because instead of showing uh, edit, create, update, and so on, permissions for every single one, you need to list them once. You have, besides the, the content types, uh, that's probably how it's gonna work, or the, uh, or the field names, Right, so you only have the number of uh, fields, uh, the permissions that the field permission module wants to work. So it's basically n plus m instead of n times n m. Uh, that's why uh, this uh, particular wireframe works a lot better than the current one. Then how would that work in terms of, so I guess you just turn things off at no render time? I mean, how, so you're, or yeah. Field level access. Yeah. Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, you, it's pretty easy, you know. Uh, right now, core already uh, 
core already basically has uh, the mechanism for it. The field access system itself is in core already. You only need the field permission system uh, to uh, actually uh, put a life into it because core produces uh, hooks uh, for field permissions currently, which are not implemented by anything. So this? The title of the talk also mentions node access control. Uh, and Ken Rickert uh, was uh, supposed to do that, but he have merged that into his uh, workflow talk. Okay. Uh, we uh, very, very deliberately have chosen users instead of nodes, uh, because we are definitely not going there. <laughs> that's, that's basically a different uh, bag of heart. <laughs> when is that talk? I have no idea. It's uh, it's a uh, workflow uh, editorial workflow talk. You can find it under that name. Well, uh, thanks everybody for uh, attending. I think if we do not have anything scheduled, uh, then I think I'm going to hijack this time and uh, talk about things that I, am, I wasn't ready to go uh, public yet, but uh, I think even half-baked, uh, they are interesting enough to begin talking uh, about them. Uh, so... That's probably all being recorded still. So. That's not a problem. <laughs> that's not a problem. It, uh, it, uh, at some point, I need to uh, begin to ask the community uh, what you guys think. And uh, why not now? I, I have it written down. I don't have slides. Uh, I have had it uh, written down for uh, quite some time. Some of you might have remembered that I have created uh, a blog post, whether it was time to uh, fork uh, Drupal, uh, but the consensus was that not. Now, uh, at that point, I had a, a document ready, which I have discussed uh, with a few uh, prominent contributors uh, about uh, what could be done. Uh, I have uh, tentatively named this uh, jury. Oh, well, they are not slides as such, uh, but let me see what I can do about that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, good. We have something here, so let me switch my laptop screen as well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I presume it does. I presume I don't need to. That doesn't stop me from doing it, right? <laughs> Figuring out a UI takes um, so uh, much more time than doing it. Uh, okay, I can try that. It's uh, it's not Ubuntu in the first place, by the way. Are you No. Uh, I'm using KD. Okay. This didn't work. Okay. Uh, let me redo this. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to fix that, but I, I'm going to talk uh, while I'm doing it. So uh, there is a meta framework talk. Uh, there's a, a framework thread where we were talking about uh, how to make it uh, more. Uh, yeah, it's it's going to be enough. Uh, I am going to move this into a separate window and resize it until it works. Uh, that's not going to be a, a big problem. <laughs> Oh, good. Okay. Well, that's good enough. So, uh, and in that uh, thread, somebody said that there are a lot of uh, smelly fruits. Uh, there are a lot of uh, smelly, low-hanging fruits. 
uh, which I said that uh, that probably that should be called durian, uh, and so this one uh, is about that's why it's called durian. Um, so uh, what we are going, what I was planning to do here. Uh, <laughs> Better. Better. Uh, so uh, I was planning to use the CMI initial uh, CMI style config files where we are storing uh, YAML config files on a randomized pass and YAML in the database as well. Uh, you must be familiar with this if you were uh, following the uh, CMI uh, threads on groups.org. Uh, now, the biggest change that I was planning to do. Uh, is that right now we are struggling with rebuilding various registries because there's a chicken egg problem here. You know, you need to have a working Drupal to fire those info hooks, uh, but in order to have a working Drupal, you need to have those registries rebuilt already. Uh, we are pretty desperately coding around this by changing the order, various things are rebuilt. And it pretty much works right now by applying a lot of praying and duct tape. Uh, instead, what we could do is to switch uh, part of it into static parsing. So have a rebuild phase where you run a rebuild script which loads every uh, file based on extensions. Uh, and uh, parses out things. Uh, so uh, this means that Drupal wouldn't run there, so the chicken egg problem is solved. Now, the other big thing, uh, the, the other big change uh, I wanted to do is uh, that the uh, hook implementations uh, got a, a naming schema where uh, it is absolutely trivial that they are hooks. Uh, there is already an issue about it where we want to change uh, the uh, uh, separator uh, from uh, a, a simple underscore to underscore hook underscore, but I was thinking that we should call them actually hooks. So the function name starts with hook, uh, followed by the uh, hook name, and then after two uh, underscores, you have the module name. So you're saying that you would call it like hook, menu, my module, whatever. Yes. Uh, one of the things that uh, this would uh, allow us uh, is to have include files uh, implement hooks. Right now, we have a module called system module, uh, which is just an abomination because uh, it implements a lot of things. It's basically like a potpourri. Uh, it implements default uh, hooks for everything, basically, because include files just cannot implement hooks. Uh, this would solve it, right? Because uh, we have a parsing script. It would parse out uh, includes as well without knowing anything. You do not actually need to write mo uh, an existing module name after the hook name. It doesn't matter what you write after it. You can write after it, say, Drupal or include or whatever. It's just going to work. Uh, now. So you're saying that yep. hooks, hooks, so one model could implement one hook many times? Like oh, sure. Names? Of course. As long as you namespace it so that, you know, there's, there are no collisions, why not? I can see a reason why uh, uh, that wouldn't be a uh, possibility. Well, now, then you, then you can have two modules declaring the same book, no? Uh, well, you, could, uh, you can have such a problem right now as well, right? Uh, so mm, it's pretty much voluntary uh, namespacing right now. Uh, what's nicer with this concept is because you have a parser. Uh, instead of including them, you could get an error instead of just php fattling out, because you have defined the function name uh, two times. So actually, uh, you, uh, we could uh, handle that much nicer. Now, hmm, hook implementations. Uh, 
with the various uh, iterations of the form API, we have found that it is very handy to have a form state uh, object. Well, it's not an object, it's an array, but that's just semantics. So I'm going to call it an object. I don't care about whether it's an array or an object. So uh, have a hook state uh, object that you hand to a, every hook implementation and it is going to record basically whatever we want, but what we want most of all is uh, what hooks have fired already, and what, hooks, uh, what hook implementations fired already, and which one are going to fire uh, with this. Uh, what we could do is to get rid of alters and just make uh, every hook operate much like alters right now. Because what you could do is that if you have a module which currently uh, wants to alter a form structure, uh, it wants to alter something in a form structure that was added by taxonomy module, then you could just look at the hook state where the taxonomy has already fired. If it didn't yet, then tell the system that you want to fire later. Yes, yes, just, uh, yes, move yourself uh, that you want to fire again. Uh, obviously, we need some watchdog there so that uh, two modules fighting each other uh, cannot trigger a, an infinite uh, loop. But, uh, yeah, basically after, like, I don't know, like 20 uh, iterations going over the list, uh, just uh, trigger an exception. That's very easy uh, to solve uh, because you still have module invoke, right? Uh, so, that's good. Uh, another thing, so th this would uh, immediately solve a huge bunch of issues. Uh, if you are following the bug report uh, where we are trying to solve the problem, where uh, if you have multiple alters firing, which, of course, the worst case is forms, because now you have uh, the uh, form ID specific alter firing, you have the base specific alter firing, and you have the generic alter firing, uh, then ordering that, which module fires when, is a downright nightmare. Uh, we, would, we could get rid of that, because modules can decide dynamically who wants to fire when. You don't need to do waiting. You don't need to do uh, hook uh, module implements alter. Nothing of this is necessary. You just look at it, whether the module you want to alter have already fired or not. Easy, very easy. Uh, it's, it, 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 and this is literally a bug that uh, with, within the current system, you just can't solve because whatever solution you pick, it's going to be an ordering that doesn't work for some uh, use case. My solution, on the other hand, because it's dynamic, it's definitely going to work every, uh, for every case, because you just decide at runtime uh, what you want to do. So that's good. Uh, next thing, uh, to loosen up Drupal without changing it too much. Uh, we have a problem here, uh, whereas any module can call any other module at, as it wants. There is basically, uh, and this creates a lot of problems, whereas we need to load everything. We, when we have tried to uh, split up Drupal in six into include files, it turns out to be more or less impossible because people were just calling across modules pretty much one. So what you can do is that if you want to provide an API, then provide it in a class. Even if it's just uh, a function, you can create a class with a single uh, uh, static function because a class can be auto-loaded. I can't help that PHP is so brain that, that you cannot uh, auto-load functions. You can auto-load classes, so you, you can do that. And once again, we have the preparser, which are going to find every class and store them. And right now, uh, we have the problem, whereas uh, 
we have the pre-database stage and we have the post-database stage and we pretty much need to operate separate registries for that. We won't need to do that uh, because we can store these pre-parsed uh, things uh, in, a, uh, in simply a, a config file uh, on the desk. So that's there. So you, you mentioned these uh, parsing, parsing scripts are somehow invoked? Uh, there's nothing uh, somehow invoked. You invoke it. Who's uh, the end user? Yes. What, by hitting a specific PHP file? More or less. Uh, mm, there are many ways to do this. Uh, one way, so ideally, uh, the way the way things would be easiest, to be honest, is that if you don't need a module, then you delete it and reparse. If you want to install a module, you copy it in place and reparse. Which means that how do you install a module? There are two ways. One is that you use the Drupal built-in uh, module installer, which already exists in 7. It's not a new thing. In Drupal 8, it's probably going to get a module browser as well. I have seen that uh, there was a GSOC project for that. Uh, that's one way. The other way is that you have command line and you use Drush already. Right? There are no other ways. I'm not going to support the case where you FTP off uh, stuff. That's deprecated. That's just deprecated. If you do that, it's your problem, basically, how you reparse. It's not my problem. Uh, I, uh, because at that point we uh, begin to uh, delve into the uh, problem where you have, where it is not sure whether the uh, web server is able to write the disk. The install system in seven solved this problem, right? That's what the that's what the big thing is in seven about that. So I, I'm just basically not going to solve that problem twice. There's no point in that, and so. And the last thing I want to say here uh, about, although I have a lot more listed here, I don't want really to go uh, into every single piece of these, is that we really want, to, uh, and that's basically just a footnote, much smaller than this, but it's very important, that we really need to get rid of the current pager system, where it actually counts uh, how many items you have for a given uh, query, and use something uh, like Google does, right? What, uh, do a Google search, what you are going to see is you have one to 10, and then you have an arrow. Google is not going to give you what, because uh, Google tells you that there are approximately uh, 3 million or 100 million uh, results. It's not gonna give you a precise number in the first place, and it's definitely not going to show a last link where you can jump to the page number 1,025,000, right? I'm just doing that, why? Because it's, because it's a, a performance killer. So what we, could, what we could do, what we should do, uh, is that uh, we uh, should kill uh, this sort of uh, paging and just give you a, a, an opportunity to page more and more in. By the way, I don't know whether you have seen statistics, nobody pages in. That's basically nobody. So there is no point in doing those, to be honest. Uh, the number of clicks past uh, page one uh, drops so fast that they become a statistic uh, anomaly uh, very, very quickly. So, uh, so these are some of the uh, big changes that I want to do in Drupal. And uh, when I have looked at how uh, Drupal is currently handled, I have found that it would be next to impossible to introduce these changes because with the testing system uh, and our procedures right now, you would need to, to convert, for example, every single hook in one patch to this, which borders impossible. What we have come to is that, since we have talked about procedures a lot, so some solutions that we might want to introduce is uh, timing big patches 
actually there is now uh, some of the big, I think that the rename everything into a core subdirectory is uh, scheduled already. November 3, I think? One. One. I wasn't following enough, apparently. So it's actually scheduled for November 1. Uh, so that you don't need to endlessly re-roll, you know, once the community reached uh, an agreement that this is going to be a good idea, you know when, it, when you need to uh, get re-rolled by. Uh, the other thing that we were t talking about is that, for example, we were doing uh, with Peter where you want to uh, tear apart uh, hook menu into a hook router, hook tabs, uh, save your links separately, and there we have stopped because uh, we weren't able to come up with good ideas about what do you do about local actions and contextual links which have been grafted uh, onto poor uh, hook menu in 7. What we would do, what we could do, is that we could comment out tests, we could comment out failing tests, commit the big change, open criticals for those failing tests which, along with the gates, would mean that if there were so many failing tasks that we go over 15, then we first need uh, to fix those. But still, you could get in a large change, you could still get in a large change without doing all uh, of core in one step. Because uh, with the current title coupled drop hole, that's just too much work. So these are some process changes which were uh, somewhat triggered by this because the problem is that Drupal has become something that with the current, you know, let's do a patch message is not easily fixable anymore. Uh, you will hear probably about some of Laurie's plans, which are notably distinct from mine, because what I am planning to do here, if you uh, watch this, it's fundamentally still going to be Drupal. I'm not changing over into another pattern uh, of things. I'm just, I'm just uh, drawing some conclusions uh, about several versions of Drupal that we were working on and try to do something a, a little bit better while, uh, while loosening the very tight coupling of Drupal, which basically causes the most problems. So, for example, uh, if you want to unit test a hook invocation, you can mock the hook state object and just call a single implementations and because it only depends on the hook state object it 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 and uh, the data structure it gets it is not going to depend on every other module that actually alters that data structure so this uh, so these changes uh, are moving into uh, drupal into a much looser coupled uh, state so, Jennifer. Yeah, um, you mentioned that you wanted to make it so that you can sort of FTP a module up to a site. Yes. So. Well, if you do that, then you basically need to initiate the, the same sequence as you would do if you would use the installer. And at that point, it just becomes a question, why are you not using the installer? Let, let me tell you why you might yes. I can work on it, I can add a module, I can uh, make a patch, I can make a custom module, whatever, 